cliffhanging ending. Um, they were waiting for it. And then this extraordinary day occurred when the, a bag of photographs arrived and the whole story, the circle of the entire story completed itself. In, I hope, um, readers will find a very joyful way when I was expecting it to be utter tragedy. Do you want to talk about, in a sense, the process that led to those photographs coming? Um, not really. <laughs> not really, because I think that well, would give well me a keeping the <laughs> They're keeping the middle secret. Well, I, I think that part of it actually involves people who wouldn't. Your grandparents' want blood is. <laughs> my grandparents. Well, the issue of your grandparents' blood is such an extraordinary one because yeah. I, all the way through the book, you're, I'm thinking to myself as I'm telling the story, whose blood do I have <laughs> of these people? And when I discovered whose blood I had, I was very, I, I was very surprised, and um, I don't know the great debate that we all have, nature versus nurture. I don't know what makes us, but I do know that my mother is an artist, I am an art critic, and my grandfather, in my true belief, had he been free to have an education of any sort, would have been an artist too. So there is some, possibly, there is some connection, I don't know, between those things. Um, however, I would also say that the events um, in my mother's early life, the events uh, of her early life have governed her so uh, deeply that if she were here, I wonder whether she would say it was the blood or the... Or how, the how much of the story had assembled itself before your mother's death? My mother isn't dead. Sorry. My mother's not dead. Yeah. No. My, my grandmother's death? Your, you I mean, mean grandma, yeah. My grandmother's death. Um, well, um, my, it, it's an excellent question, Willie, because the, the tragedy in the book is that my grandmother, who, I, who is that woman, yeah. who I remember as a lady with very long clothes and a huge hearing aid wearing a hairnet, who was a very <laughs> gentle, a lovely woman. And we did have to ask her a question because we had to know where to go um, to find the crucial document in the story, which is the legal document. And it was agonizing for her to be asked. And I still wish, I still wish that that part of the research, which was done by my mother, um, had happened in the days when there was the internet, because we would have been able to find these answers without actually troubling her. And she needed never to have known, perhaps, that we knew more than she had understood. Was your, was your mother at any point upset by what she found or by the search or I mean, was yeah. she was encouraging to... no 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 another excellent question would you um she, she tried to find out what had happened to her on that beach herself um until from the age of 60 to the age of about 80 um she didn't try very hard because as the years passed i think she became much more concerned about her children and her grandchildren and so on and then she really stopped um, and when I was writing this book, I really had to ask for her blessing. I wanted her to write the book, um, mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask her blessing very much because I thought it would dislodge um, painful, the foundations of her thinking about her past a bit. And so actually my mother, who is 94, um, she hasn't, she's very fragile and she's not in a state where she could really read this book. Um, I've read parts of it to her, but I have only, in fact, read the parts. Is she aware of it. how well it's done? Does she? No. Is she aware? No. 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 I mean, she's the most modest woman, and she can't understand um, this. This, I say, this. I'm speaking really from the heart to anybody who's watching this now. Um, my mother has said to me that she could not understand how anyone would write this book. <laughs> uh, because it was the story of an insignificant life and this is how she feels about herself and of course I think that no human life is insignificant as we all do um, and that my mother's story is actually quite extraordinary because the triumph of this story is that from this hellish childhood she flies free 
and never in fact ever returns back to this village. She flies free at the age of 18, suddenly someone notices a great teacher, it's a hymn of praise to teachers, um, notices that she can draw brilliantly and that she should become an artist and she goes to art college and she goes to Edinburgh where she meets my father and here we go. And she never ever went back. So you can imagine how I think how hard it would have been for her um, that I was trying to write this story. Uh, what she knows about it simply is that people like bling. They like beaches. <laughs> she says, oh, but it's the story of a beach because it is also the story of a stretch of sand. So. <laughs> what was, was strange was that in the sense there was some, you got her to write part of her story. And, I got her to write part of her story. Yeah. As, a birthday, as a birthday present. Yes. And yeah. her, style, her style is not dissimilar to yours. The, I mean, you can, you can pass on... Um, you could pass on more than blonde hair and blue eyes in your teeth. <laughs> well, um, that's very, very, very kind of you. I mean, obviously, I for me, um, the whole of this book really is actually, it's like a little, um, a, a, I have constructed a little platform almost, really, for her writing. That's what the, the point of the book is really about. Um, I wrote a, a book before this book um, called The Vanishing Man, which is about a very poor bookseller. Um, which is a, a fabulous, being, fabulous book on Velasquez that you have to come and do a Jaipur. Oh, I would love to, and I would love to. I would love to. Um, that's an excuse for uh, writing about Velasquez because no, no, no publisher wanted a, a straightforward book on Velasquez, you know, a hymn of praise from me. So, so I wrote this story about this very, very, um, to me, very uh, poignant figure, a bookseller, the bookseller of Reading. He lives in Reading and his obsession is reading. Um, and he finds this painting and his whole life is ruined by it and the consequences of it. And that book was very much about class, you know, this, huge issue in England of class and so he was very poor he wasn't educated you will immediately see the parallel between um, this bookseller and my grandfather the traveling soap salesman so I feel very keenly for these people that they were very misunderstood and in the way that we live in our country um, if you didn't have that education you were lost and lost to time because nobody knew really what you wanted to be you just end your life at the age of 13 in my grandfather's case 14 in the bookseller's case and that's the end you know you, you you don't have opportunity you don't have this sort of family behind you pushing you forward you don't have the freedoms that we have now and the democracy I hope that we have now but <clears throat> so that book was entirely about really an opportunity to write about Velasquez and this one really is uh, entirely an opportunity to write about my mother and for my mother's writing, which I think is glorious um, to appear. Um, and if she were here, she would be reading you. I'm not going to read it just now because it's long, but she would be reading you the things she wrote for me when I was 21 um, the, about these strange villagers going up and down the road with, you know, great long beards, you know, <laughs> born in the 1880s, most of them and so on. And, um, and about this tiny little village and all the people who lived in it. So it was a kind of mythical that, village. That Myth community is very central to the book too. It does have that quality of yes. this portrait of, of a kind of Agatha Christie village. Uh, yes. yes. 1930s Lincolnshire. Yes. And actually I should say that um, on behalf of, <laughs> I must be honest about this, my mother wrote a wonderful account of the pitiful um, insanitary conditions in the dairy across the road and the dairy is this man you know with his bag going up and down the village and um he has these two cows and they how they make their living from half a pint of milk sold a week i don't know but anyway they did and as she says they they spared no expense for hygiene and it was a disgusting filthy place and there's a beautiful piece of little piece of writing in the book by my mother remembering this village and the way that they came round with the milk which of course had never had any testing and wasn't pasteurized and so on and they would come to people's houses and try to sell you know basically a cup of milk uh, and so on and so I wrote about I, 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 I her section of writing is in the book as she wrote it she wrote it for me uh, in the 1980s and 
<gasps> the family, the descendants of the dairy were furious. <laughs> and I have a lawyer's letter saying, you know, can you Actually prove... Actually lawyer's letters. Can you, can you prove that the dairy was unclean in 1929? <laughs> well, no, you couldn't <laughs> prove that it was unclean. But here is this beautiful testimony written by my mother. But I did feel quite upset on my mother's behalf. So in fact, I did take some pains to interview <laughs> one or two other people from the village. <gasps> that dairy was filthy. <laughs> so um, I think we have managed to, I hope that we've managed to um, placate the descendants of the dairy farmer. But um, many other people in the village remember that story. And it moves me very much that actually my mother's tales of that village are completely borne out by local historians and by the people who lived in the village and by photographs, of course. Given the wall of silence, did you get any opposition from the village about digging away at this? I mean, after, once it came out, no, nothing. No, um, and actually I had very touching to me, I had a letter from Lily Bodice's granddaughter <laughs> <laughs> saying that she was very pleased that Lily Bodice had been mentioned. So I don't, I don't think so. immortalised. <laughs> immortalised, yes. <laughs> Laura, we've got, we've got some uh, questions here. Neha has, has asked, is, was the one particular moment of serendipitous discovery that, uh, that for you uh, um, yes. propelled yes. you forward? There really was, and what an excellent question, because um, in a way, you know, when we watch films about people trying to solve a mystery and so on, you know, there's always a linchpin moment, you know, a dramatic moment when it, everything changes. And actually, for me, the dramatic moment really was um, the discovery of uh, a large and, I mean, really magnificent, actually, I've got it, um, a magnificent cam uh, photograph taken. You've got all your props um, here. I've got all my props here. Um, it's, it's actually, it's two photographs. Oh, wait a minute. I don't have it here. Sorry. Um, it's, it's a photograph taken of the people in the big house and they are bowling along wearing exquisite Edwardian dresses and so on in the countryside with big straw hats and, you know, a picnic basket. And it's it's rather wonderful. And I saw this thing and thought, this is an amazing photograph. And I hadn't seen it before. I found it. Um, and I was trying to identify everybody in it. And I I had shown it to my I showed it to my mother and she said that's X, Y, and Z. What are the initials of the man in the middle? They are HCC. Uh, and and I suddenly thought, wait a minute, those are the initials from the trunk. Right. The beautiful trunk. It's a different wait a minute, hold on. Maybe he's the owner of the camera, etc. And then I I took the, the photograph, thank God for these terribly technically gifted um, photography historians. I took the photograph taken um, of the three figures walking along the road and the photograph I showed you all of my grandmother to the phot photography historian at the Victorian Album Museum and said, could this be the same camera? And they said, yes, it's the same camera. It'll be the same camera. So that fused two parts of the story together for me. And I loved that moment because really, I mean, I sit at home and write about Rembrandt or whatever most of the time. And, and um, you know, uh, I don't spend vast amounts of time trying to read police reports. And for me, just as a writer, this was thrilling because there were different forms of evidence that I could look at. So thank you. And that was the exact moment. Yes. We have a question from Ombra Cash who asks, uh, is it a is it a, a a search to solve a mystery or a search to discover yourself? Are you trying to find the truth about your own self? Yeah. Wow! What exceptional questions coming from you in India. Um, um, no, it's not about me. Um, and actually, um, I didn't want to have. I didn't want to appear in this book. Um, the passage I read to you at the beginning was the, the way I started the book originally, but a couple of pages later, I, I start to write in the first person, and I have to, because I have to explain who, why, um, why I am undertaking this story. And I didn't want to do this, but the publisher said, you really have to, because when you start to discover uh, the photographs, uh, what kind of camera it was, where the trunk came from, um, 
who carved this little box here. There's a box. Um, there we go. Yeah. The box from the, which is a strange little box carved from driftwood on this beach. You can't just suddenly say they appeared out of nowhere and, and someone discovered them. You actually have to say you discovered them and that you are telling this story. But um, no, I, I, it's a wonderful question. I didn't come to any conclusions whatsoever about myself except what I already knew, which is how deeply I love my mother. <laughs> oh. Now, one question I'd love to ask, but we're very close to, to the end now, but um, you, I mean, each of your, all of your books have been very visual, but they're very different from each other. One, one on portraits, one on Velazquez, uh, one on your, on your mother. What, what can we expect from you next? Because uh, <laughs> these, these are linked, but they're, they're, they're very, very, very. Well, um, I'm sitting in lockdown in London, as, as you are, I think, in India. And in the three months we've been in lockdown, this is exactly all I've done is think, what will my next book, what should it next be? And in fact, this week I discovered something that um, related again to India because I was thinking about you all. And um, I have been interested in, for a long time, um, the a phenomenon of second sight. Um, which um, is, a, I come from Scotland and there's a big tradition in which people see things. And I'm very interested in people seeing things. The Western things. Isles, so, particularly. The Western Isles. And my father was born on Lewis, on the island of Lewis in the Antarctic. So, and he had some inkling of it. And I'm interested in it because it connects um, certain parts of the world. And I was always wondered, how do people actually see when they see it? I mean, is it like... Um, us talking to each other now I'm in a room and then suddenly there's Willie Dalrymple talking to me in India and he's very clear to me or is it some sort of strange phenomenon um, like a shadow or a ghost or something like that so I've been looking at I spent a lot of time thinking about that and wondering whether it, in a way painting which is my passion and my profession whether there were connections between painting and second sight and so on and then I came up with story um, which also connects people in Iceland with people in India and um, so I think I, I once wrote an article um, in the Isle of Barra about people with the second sight no. uh, and, and interviewed a lot of people on, on Ben Killer and Barra and what was interesting was that the, the they were very clear that the second sight started to go when television came and, really? it, was only, and it was only the the generation before television that used to see it. And they, I mean, I've heard this separately from several several uh, islanders on different islands. And, <laughs> and they all used to see funerals of people that hadn't died, of sip, yes. sip sinking that hadn't sunk, uh, yes. and then it would happen. Yes. Uh, but the gift, <laughs> the gift went as soon as music and television came in. Music. Oh, fascinating. I think you should write this book. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you for the question, but it will be it will be about um, seeing and eyes and this gift of sight that we have that um, I greatly care about more than anything, and um, a little bit about a blind painter and yeah. So I don't know yet, but I hope there will be a, some sort of narrative. So the blind thank you for the, the blind. We have one you. final question before we close this from Kartik, uh, who says, "What was the biggest problem you faced researching? What was the biggest obstacle?" Another excellent question. Um, I think it was, well, I, I can't name these people, but it, the biggest problem was that I was sure the story was wrong. I was sure that people were blaming the wrong people. And I was sure that uh, the villainy of my grandfather was more complex than it seemed. And about my grandfather, um, nobody told me, for example, that he was a soldier, um, that he was a he, he had medals, um, First World War, that he um, was a brilliant draftsman, that he made beautiful objects, that he had taken this photograph, which I didn't see until quite recently, uh, the Vermeer photograph that I'm taking. So I I just know that whatever can be said about him whether he loved his wife, whether he was horrible to her. The photograph I showed you, for example, I think shows love for his wife. He's just married her. It's like a wedding 
self-portrait. And so I think that story is wrong. So the obstacle you asked about, um, the biggest obstacle for me was the fact that nobody agreed with me. <laughs> so there are far-flung members of this family, and I do know that what I have written has upset them. Um, I tried very hard not to, but I didn't feel that the truth was being told here. And I felt that people who were um, pilloried for almost a century possibly needed to be given the benefit of the doubt. And I'm afraid I thought that the person who had, I think I definitely felt that the person who took my mother off the beach um, in the beginning of the book where we were, which I was reading, that it was probably somebody else who took her off that beach, and it was. So, <laughs> um, so I think- anything you I, left out, which you was significant, which you felt that you couldn't put in for various reasons? Yes. Um, yes, I think there are, yeah. Okay, there is something that I have, strongly left out of this book um, and it's a very personal thing um, which is the ways in which I think my mother um, having endured what she endured growing up then endured it again in her own marriage and um, I would never ever write about that and in fact I would never talk to anyone about that <laughs> Where am I talking to you in India? Um, so I think I could have written more, um, a lot more about the, that. And I know many, I do know many more things, I do. But for example, um, I give an example of something I know, but I didn't put in this book. Um, the people in that big house that I was talking about, they had a son and the son um, vanished in the Second World War. Um, this beach is full of people vanishing. People are always going off to sea in this story. And I call them vanishing. Vanishing, yeah. But always my, my obsession with things vanishing, which is odd given that I'm an <laughs> artist. My seeing is not vanishing. Um, and he um, he was regarded as a terribly... Uh, he, people always talked about him as if he might have disappeared for some sort of... Um, um, the word not exactly corrupt reason but that he he was a shadowy figure let's say well he really wasn't he was gay uh, i didn't put this in the book because i know that he's not a, he's not actually really a figure in this book but i know that only i think that there's no evidence of that he died at the age of 19 on our ship that went down in the in the second world war and what i think is right is that he was held in contempt by the people of this village. Um, but I can't say so, and I would not say so because I have no evidence of that at all. So what I have done in the book is to write about him in a, with a very great degree of honor, and I hope a lot of sympathy. Um, Laura, so that I think we, we've run out of time, but okay. I just want to say to anyone listening that this is, is not only a, a wonderful story in itself and a wonderful book, but it's also a, an absolute masterclass in how to manage a non-fiction story. And any writers out there um, with stories, whether family stories or otherwise, that want to see how you can produce a masterly work of non-fiction from really quite simple materials. I mean, there's nothing, you know, sort of astonishingly, earth-breakingly, there's no alien invasions or, or zombies popping up or, you know, it's, it is a, a story of, of, of everyday people, and yet you you spun it in such a clever and masterly way that it that it is a great book, and, and so uh, I highly recommend it to anyone uh, anyone uh, watching now. It, it, it's one of the, the great nonfiction books of of our time. Oh, well, I am highly honoured and highly grateful. Thank you so much. And coming from you, a master of nonfiction, I am very very flattered thank you so much and thank you. thank you all i wish i could see your faces but thank you very much for having me thank you so much william and thank you so much laura i mean that was a fascinating idyllic village with so much of so many stories and that beat seems to be the bermuda triangle of all people everybody's going to rush right off to buy the book but thank you so much for for this wonderful session and thank you all for watching and being such a great audience and Thank our official radio partners, Red FM, Bajati Raho, 
And please do remember to log in at 9 p.m. for our next session, The Far Field, a Madhuri Vijay in conversation with Meetha Kapoor. Madhuri Vijay's award-winning debut novel charts a journey of discovery from Bangalore to the distant and conflicted landscapes of Kashmir. In conversation with Meetha Kapoor, she speaks of the craft of fiction and shares her inspirations and learnings while writing her first book. And now from the Jaipur Music Stage Archive, we present Swanand Kirkire and Ankur Tiwari in concert. Swanand Kirkire is a lyricist, actor, playback singer, a scriptwriter and director for Hindi television, films, and theater. He's written songs for more than 50 films and is a two-time winner of the National Film Award for Best Lyricist. He received his first National Film Award for the song Bante, Bande Metha Dam, Bande Matram from the film Lage Raho Munna Bhai, and the second from Three Idiots. Ankur Tiwari is a storyteller and has been a singer-songwriter with the popular independent bank Ankur and the Ghalat family since 2009. His work as music supervisor and the popular soundtrack for Zoha Akhtar's Gully Boy was greatly appreciated. Enjoy and see you back at 9 p.m. Oh, 